Today's topic is also, Rylan, very common sense. It's more often than not going to be, oh, that's what they call that. Because today's topic is how introduced species affect ecosystems. And I'll give you the summary right now in a question. What do you think if we bring new species into areas that they've never been, is that usually a positive or is that usually a negative? negative. There, you know the lesson. All I'm going to be, Allison, is giving you terminology and examples. So, some terminology. The fancy word for something that was there first is called a native species. These are plants and animals that naturally inhabit an area. You'd be amazed what you think is a native species and actually is not. There are many species that have been in North America for a couple of hundred years, so you think they're here and they're native. As an example, my understanding, earthworms are not native to North America. Really? Yeah. Came along with crops and spread. Like, pardon me? Some deliberately, we'll talk about specific examples. And then there's something called introduced species. As an example, in Europe, they now grow corn because corn is a popular food staple. Corn is native to North America. It only came to Europe in, in the last 300 years as a food crop. Uh, potatoes are native to North America, not to Europe. And they were exported and they grow lots of them in Europe now. There are also things from Europe that were brought here. Ireland's famous for potatoes. Yeah, I know, but they were introduced. They're not native to Ireland. Okay? So stuff that you thought was from a certain country all the time. Actually, no. F stuff moves around. Uh, these are also called foreign species. And I'm going to argue, Allison, that even though I didn't give you these words until now, if I had said, what do you think a native species means? What do you think a foreign species? You probably could have figured it out just from the descriptions. Oh, uh, where they didn't previously uh, exist. Thank you. Getting ahead of myself. Is that what you're going to say, Dylan, that I missed something? Now, there are some foreign species that are neutral or possibly benevolent. Not every new species does damage. The ones that do damage, we have a special word for it, begins with letter I. You may have seen it on signs when you're driving on the low heat because there are signs that say blank species of plant here, stay away. Anybody know the word? Invasive. These are organisms that take over the habitat of native species. Or instead of taking over the habitat, they might uh, invade their bodies. Parasites, weakening their immune system. Push pencils down. So what are some ways that introduced species can affect ecosystems? Comp, uh, spell that right, Mr. Do it. Competition. The new species goes after the same type of food as the species that was as the native species, but it's better than, at it. Predation. Most of the birds that were native to Hawaii have been wiped out by the introduction of cats and pigs that eat birds' nests because the birds had never seen them before. They've never evolved any defense for them whatsoever. And so there's some gorgeous species of birds that were wiped out within 100 years of people showing up. Disease. If the, new, if the native species had never been exposed to the disease before, their immune systems can't fight it but the introduced species might carry that disease and just be able to fight it off naturally. So to them, it might be like catching a cold, but the, the native species might die off. Humans did that terribly. When humans came to North America, they brought with them smallpox, which the native population had no immunity for, and it wiped out major portions of the native population. Parasites, parasites. Uh, 
Uh, right now, for example, beehives are dying off everywhere. We need bees terribly. Bees pollinate the vast majority of our crops. And the bees are dying off because one of the reasons is uh, bee mites, these tiny little parasite bugs that are all over them and don't let them grow up properly. And those were introduced. Uh, until about 10 years ago, Vancouver Island was the last place in North America where the bee mites had not spread. So BC Ferries was very meticulous looking for vehicles that were transporting beehives or anything like that. You couldn't transport beehives from the mainland to Vancouver Island. They just wouldn't let you. But I've heard now that the mites made it across there and all their colonies, all their bee colonies are getting wiped out too. And habitat alteration. In the U.S., in the southern U.S., in the coastal U.S., uh, they were dealing, because people like to live on cliffs overlooking the ocean, but the waves erode the cliffs. And so in a misguided attempt to stabilize the cliffs in the 1930s and 40s, they introduced a vine called kudzu, which grows about a foot a day, I think. It grows incredibly fast. It's overrunning everything because they don't know how to stop it. Oops. It's altering the entire habitat. It's covering the trees, it's covering the landscape, and choking off all the life to all the other growth that's there. Oops. So let's talk about some of these. Uh, competition. While the native species have an established balance, the invasive species can throw off this balance by competing for essential resources. Okay. And I don't just mean food. It could even be something as simple as, oh, they use the same types of burrows or they like they nest in the same type of tree. Or so it doesn't just have to be food. It could be habitat or living living location. Predation so invasive species may have a huge advantage as the native species might have no methods to fight or escape. You want an example? Oh, here's a great name for a species. Yellow, leave a space. They're not just called yellow ants. They're actually called yellow crazy ants which suggests to me that they're probably pretty swarming, biting, ferocious. Otherwise, why would they be called crazy? And I, they're yellow colored. OK, great name. They escaped from cargo ships in West, from West Africa, and uh, they've devastated the red crab population on Christmas Island, which is uh, off the coast of Australia. Uh, they've killed an estimated 20 million land crabs. Crabs had never seen ants before. Didn't know how to defend themselves again. Didn't know they were hostile. St and still don't. It's not built into their, their instinct or their system. Here's one that Canada is dealing with. So uh, disease and parasites by weakening certain species due to parasites, that may mean that other less dominant species can out-compete what was once the dominant species, significantly changing the ecosystem. So one Canada and the Great Lakes deals with in the 1880s, parasitic lampreys, which are essentially tubular blood-sucking fish, they're really quite nasty, they invaded the Great Lakes and they latch onto the fish. They have a big spiral row of teeth and they <coughs> bite onto the fish and they suck their blood and that, they, hey, they're gonna go for the bigger fish with more blood, which are usually at the top of the food chain. They weaken those and that significantly changed the ecosystem of the Great Lakes. Other species, other fish have moved into the niches and it's changed everything. Habitat alteration. So this can change the physical structure of the ecosystem by digging, burrowing, blocking sunlight if it's a type of plant, changing the chemistry of the ecosystem. Maybe they give off a chemical and they release that into the system. 
before you turn the page, or no, turn, yeah, I gave you some uh, examples on the next page. So uh, anytime you cross the border, you may see about 100 meters past the border, boaters are supposed to stop and make very certain that their boats, the bottoms and propellers, are cleaned of Eurasian milfoil. So this was probably brought to North America in the late 1800s. It was first identified in BC in 1970 in Okanagan Lake or Lake Okanagan. It's highly adaptable. It thrives in disturbed and contaminated waters, forms wide, dense mats at lake surfaces, cutting off the sunlight to the organisms below and interfering with recreational activities that makes the water disgusting. It can grow from plant fragments, which are often spread by boats. So in the Okanagan, the plant is controlled right now by rototilling, by plowing, literally, to cut out roots from the lake bottoms. A native weevil that eats milfoil shows promise as a biological control. Like I said, that Simpsons clip that I showed you isn't that far-fetched. So we're thinking about maybe introducing another species. Actually, no, this is a native species. We're hoping to cultivate and uh, increase a native species that feeds on European milfoil. Maybe that'll help be a natural way to control it. But the weevils must be cultivated and brought into an infested areas in large numbers to be effective. Yep. It doesn't sound that way. We didn't have any. Any what? Any well, uh, it hasn't made its way very far north yet, but it's, it's almost We're inevitable. Arm of the Ocanagan, right? Pardon me? Salmon arm is one of the arms of the Ocanagan. But I think the water flows from there, not towards there. Does it not? I think. Pretty sure we're at the end of it. Okay. It it may be there. It may not have made it may or it may not have made it all the way across the lake. Norway rats. These invaders probably came aboard early European ships or fur trading ships because rats are pretty good at smuggling themselves in. They are extremely well adapted to almost every environment. They feed on almost anything. Do we have rat problems? Hey, go walk downtown Vancouver, push a dumpster aside, and you'll just see how many rats come tumbling out. They're everywhere, okay? Not a native species. Uh, a female rat can produce up to 72 young per year. That's more than one baby a week on average. So on, it really hammers island populations. So on the Queen Charlotte Islands or Haida Gwaii, they've caused a decline in ground nesting seabirds because the birds have never developed any uh, means to protect their nests on the ground from rats, and rats like eggs, okay? Efforts are currently underway to control rat populations by using poisons. What's the problem with using poisons? It's not just rats that eat the poisons. Bullfrogs are an invasive species. So they were brought to BC in the 1930s as a source of frog's legs for restaurants. Well, that industry, well, how is the frog leg industry doing in restaurants right now? Great or bad? Do you know of many restaurants that serve frog's legs? No. So when that industry failed, they just dumped those bullfrogs that were still alive into the wild. Ah, throw them out the back door. They caused no problems until about 1990 when for some reason they began to breed much more rapidly. Can they reached a tipping point. They've since taken over habitats in the southwest, eaten so many native frogs that they've made the red-legged frog an endangered species. They can grow as big as dinner plates. Oh, yeah. And they'll even attack ducks and small mammals. They're big. On southern Vancouver Island, bullfrogs and their tadpoles are removed as quickly as possible from an area. If they're discovered in a pond, Conservation Canada comes and tries to clean them out of the pond. It's hoped that this will block further spread into a sensitive watershed because Vancouver Island is a big island. There are many species there that have never developed evolutionary, evolutionary a defense for a lot of these. Uh, the other place that's dealing with bullfrogs, Australia. And it's Australia, they're spending millions a year. They've drawn literally a line across the continent and they're trying desperately to prevent the bullfrogs from getting across that line. Otherwise, it'll devastate a lot of their crops. Starlings, which are everywhere, are, what was that? Yeah, they kill them if they catch them. Uh, starlings, which are everywhere, are not native to North America. So I can tell you the story behind this. It says, the starling has caused a decline of several bird species, including the yellow-billed cuckoo, cuckoo, the western bluebird, and the band-tailed pigeon. So in the late 1800s, 50 breeding pairs were brought to North America. Why? In the late 1800s, I kid you not, a Shakespeare nut, a nut for Shakespeare, brought 50 of every bird that was ever mentioned in a Shakespearean play, and he released them all in North America like an idiot. Some of them died off. 
I think there's something like 20 million starlings estimated in North America from those originally fi original 50 pairs. The starlings found a home, except they're invasive. So uh, their ability to outcompete native birds for nesting sites has led to their spread across North There's no way we can get rid of the starlings. They're here. No way we can get rid of them. Starlings are a very fast-growing species. They exploit many types of nesting sites and different types of food. So they outcompete in BC western bluebirds for nesting habitats, and they can also devastate fruit crops and grain crops. If you ever live near a blueberry farm, or if you ever live near, live near a berry farm and you hear those cannons going off every so often, you're trying to scare away the starlings. Here's the next big one, Asian carp. 